It took a little bit of searching. It took a little bit of patience, but eventually I did it. In 2025, this, I think, is the most portable, fully functional, classic style, deep sky imaging rig you can possibly assemble. The ultimate portable rig. I'm not talking about smart telescopes here. There are many good smart telescope designs, and they are getting better. Some are even more compact, but they still do not have the flexibility or all the capabilities of a classic style, component by component assembled, deep sky imaging rig. And this one even has a strain wave gear harmonic drive equatorial mount. This rig is an evolution of trial and testing that I published in a few other recent Astrophotography Japan episodes where I introduced my new ASCAR FMA 180 Pro telescope and then my new ASI 585MC Air camera. This video is about mounting that OTA configuration onto the new Mini Taseek 11 harmonic drive equatorial mount and testing its performance on imaging deep sky objects. So let me first tell you about this Taseek 11 mount. I learned about it from a Damon Scotting YouTube video and quickly realized it might be exactly what I was looking for. I get most of my astrophotography accessories on AliExpress, which is where I found this mount. Prices on AliExpress vary almost weekly with frequent campaigns and discounts and coupons but the usual price for the Taseek 11 is around $400 US. I'm sure you realize that a functional harmonic drive equatorial mount for that price is extremely inexpensive, so it caught my eye. Also, FYI, the Taseek 11 mount does not have an attachment point for a counterweight bar, so 5 kilograms is its maximum capacity. And I like the concept of offering the harmonic drive portion on a Vixen bar because I have extra latitude wedges. Here is a summary of the system I have assembled. The optical tube assembly is only 1.6 kilograms, and the total weight of the entire system, not including a tripod, is under 5 kilograms, exactly 10 pounds. Currently, I am mounting the Taseek 11 on my William Optics Latitude Wedge, which I previously used with my old Skywatcher AZ GTI mount. By the way, I included my battery information here as well, that being the Celestron Power Tank Lithium LT, the smaller model. It works fine with this setup, and I have used it continuously for four hours a couple of times and still had two lights left on the four light indicator. But that was with a light power load for the sensor cooling and the dew heater was powered separately. When I took this complete setup out to test at the local park recently, this is all that I had to carry, a tripod and a small case that held the latitude wedge and the Taseek 11 mount and one backpack full of accessories, including the battery, the camera and the Ascar lens. That's it. Oh, by the way, the Taseek mount comes with the oversized black transport case that you see here. On this first night of field usage, I decided to pick easy targets, so I selected the Orion Nebula and the Horsehead Nebula. Being used to the AM5 mount now, I forgot how touchy and finicky was the William Optics Latitude Wedge for polar alignment, but I managed to get a decent alignment as you can see here. For my first go-to target ever with this mount, I selected Alnitac so I could get a good focus with a Batonoff mask. The ASI Air connection of the 585MC Air camera worked flawlessly with this mount, which requires one to select on step for the mount connectivity option. As you can see in the photos, I connected cables to the Taseek mount through its USB-C port and provided power to the mount directly from the 585MC Air. The power and data cables were wrapped in a red spiral wrap together, clean and elegant. After inserting a UV-IR cut filter 
and getting a good focus with the batten off mask, I found that the 585 MC Air guiding sensor was also reasonably in focus and hence I proceeded with a guiding calibration. It seemed to work fine, and it actually stabilized at less than one arc second RMS error, at least initially. That looked very promising. So I slewed to M42 and started taking five second photos. Here is a sped up rapid display of the guiding results over several minutes of time. The values were pretty stable, and usually stayed between one and two arc seconds RMS error. I then switched my filter to the Optolong L Extreme, boosted the exposure time to 30 seconds, and proceeded to take 20 more images. Guiding was usually less than 2 arc seconds RMS error, but occasionally jumped a bit higher. Here are some typical single frame images taken with the UV IR cut filter and the dual narrow band filter. Looking pretty good, I would say. And this is the final processed image where I combined and stacked together 15 minutes of imaging data to yield this integrated image. After this, I decided to challenge the rig a little bit more with longer exposure times. So I slewed back to Alnatac and repositioned the field of view on the Horsehead Nebula. IC434. Regarding slewing, this mount requires a little extra patience. As you can see here, this is the actual slew speed going from a southerly exposure back to the home position. It took about one minute to make this complete maneuver. It is noticeably slower than other higher priced harmonic drive mounts. I suspect it's a consequence of the design to keep the mount compact and lightweight, which I surmise was a priority. On the Horsehead Nebula, I took three minute images and here is one of those single frames taken with the Optolong L Extreme filter. Guiding was similar to my previous experience with M42, usually between one and two arc seconds RMS error. And here is the final developed image after 50 minutes of total integration time. The results, again, appeared very respectable. Obviously, more time on this target is required to get a more complete image, but the clouds rolled in and I needed to settle for less than one hour's worth of data. So, on this first night of testing, I felt very satisfied and happy with my purchase of the Taseek 11 harmonic drive mount. The results speak for themselves. Two nights later, and much to my delight, another imaging opportunity arose. And this happened to be my first real chance to image Comet Lemon. And by this time, it was already well past its peak beauty, but nevertheless, I wanted to try. At 6 p.m. or so when I did this imaging, the city light pollution was probably at its peak, and the moon, by the way, was about 70% illumination, as you can see here. Imaging comets in the city during the evening under a nearly full moon is not exactly ideal, but timing and weather parameters were beyond my control. Notice on this night, I mounted the imaging rig high on a tripod to reach over the guardrail fences on the viewing platform at the summit of Kawawa Fuji Park. I also aligned a green laser to reveal the exact location of the comet so that others at the park could also find it. In my experience, the go-to function of this Taseek mount together with the ASI Air so far has operated flawlessly. This image is a single frame 30 second unprocessed exposure of the comet taken at 5.56 p.m. when it was at 19 degrees of altitude above the horizon in the southwest.
This is a five-minute integrated image made from 10 subframes. And here is that same five-minute image next to the starless image generated in StarNet++. Now, I know these images are not so great, but it was worth the effort and yet another good test for the Taseek 11 harmonic drive mount. I really like this picture of the imaging rig with all its components in focus and nicely visible against the colorful bouquet of lights on the city horizon. Here you can see I removed the laser pointer for my next target, which was located high in the sky in the Cygnus constellation. I changed the filter to the Optolong L Extreme and slewed to the new target of SH2-119, the Clamshell Nebula. This is a lesser known target near to the North American Nebula and certainly something I never imaged before. Here is a single three minute subframe taken at 7.35 p.m. And again, this is a look at the guiding statistics, sped up for your convenience. Interestingly, there was one time when the guiding lost star contact for some unknown reason, and the right ascension just ran off in some distant direction. I had to stop the guiding and reselect another guide star and restart it again in order to correct the problem. But the imaging quickly resumed and I only lost a few minutes of time. However, I have to say that on a subsequent night of imaging, I encountered this problem again, and it occurred twice, both times after doing meridian flips. In those situations, I corrected the software confusion by deleting the prior calibration and recalibrated guiding again on the other side of the meridian. After that, it worked properly. Apparently, reacquiring the target after the flip seems to be no problem, but a restart of the guiding sometimes does not work. I managed to get two hours of good imaging data on the clamshell nebula, and here is the final processed image. The image looks pretty darn good overall for only two hours of integration time on a diffuse mission nebula. Okay, let's talk about the system advantages and disadvantages. This is truly a really lightweight, compact, and portable system. The Taseek 11 mount has full compatibility with ASI Air. The ASI 585MC Air combines imaging, guiding, and computer control into one hardware unit and its sensor dimensions are compatible with the ASCAR FMA180 Pro projected image circle. This system allows for go-to, polar alignment, guiding, dithering, camera rotation, filter selection, and all the typical flexibilities you get with a classical imaging system configuration. All components can be disassembled into parts and used with other equipment combinations, unlike smart telescopes which are restricted and limited. The 5 kilogram capacity of the Taseek mount is more than enough to handle the 1.6 kilogram optical tube assembly that I've shown here in this video. Oh, by the way, I did not mention previously, but the Taseek mount has a green laser pointer integrated into the mount chassis. This helps to quickly set up your EQ mount relative to polar reference stars and minimize the time required for accurate alignment with the celestial pole. This combination of telescope and camera on this imaging rig has a theoretical imaging resolution of 3.3 arc seconds per pixel. Pretty much all of the guiding data I have experienced was less than 4 arc seconds RMS error and in most cases it was between 1 and 2 arc seconds. So I feel comfortable that the overall guiding performance of the Taseek mount is well suited for this mini optical tube assembly. And finally, a functional harmonic drive mount for around $400? Now that qualifies as good cost performance.
As for disadvantages, the Taisik 11 mount has low cost construction quality. It has some metal and hard plastic covers, and quite frankly my unit has a small gap between two housing plates. I suggest you don't drop this mount or get too much water on it. The housing does not look to be very robust and certainly not weather resistant. Also, as you probably noticed, it has two external cable bundles that connect various parts of the mount housing on the outside. This design is obviously to reduce the size and keep the mount small and lightweight while still allowing for axis rotation. But these snap-in cable connections look to be open to the elements and that makes me a little bit nervous about dew formation and water collection. Also, it requires a little care to not damage the cables when you place it in the dovetail shoe on the latitude wedge. Just beware. And one cable, unfortunately, has a tendency to interfere with the green polar alignment laser. You have to push the wires out of the way to allow the laser to project into the sky. It's a bit inconvenient. The slewing speed of the mount might be an annoyance for some impatient imagers, but I don't really mind it. And there are occasionally some guiding issues to contend with, as we discussed earlier. A few times I encountered problems after the meridian flip, specifically the recovery or restart of guiding. I don't yet know if this is a bug or simply a unique circumstance during my usage at that time. I need more experience with the mount to understand this issue better. Also, you may want to loosen the tolerances for your post dither settle time and accuracy settings. The stringent settings you use for your higher priced mounts, like the AM5, may not be suitable for the Taseek, potentially resulting in delayed imaging restart after a dither. And a few times, for some unknown reason, I encountered a runaway guiding axis after it randomly lost star contact. I don't yet understand the reason for this or the likely frequency of this issue. These guiding issues can be a bit of an annoyance, but in my opinion they are not deal breakers. I will admit that I don't yet fully trust this mount to be completely independent. Monitoring of the imaging, dithering, and meridian flips are kind of important until I can pinpoint and correct these issues, perhaps with better parameter settings or firmware upgrades, assuming such upgrades are even scheduled. But at a price around $400, the Taseek 11, a harmonic drive mount, is still an incredible value. For comments about the 585MC Air Camera or the Ascar FMA 180 Pro Scope, please refer to my other prior videos. Well, that's it. I hope the information presented was informative. I like the rig and I plan to use it a lot more in the future. So please come back for more information updates about the Taseek 11 mount or just to enjoy some new Japan imaging adventures. Here in Yokohama, gazing up at the stars, I'm JP Astro Guy. My name is Paul Cheesegel, and thank you for watching Astrophotography Japan.